Greetings, everyone, to East Meets West at the Vice. Today, the 27th of March, Eric Austin, Austin is going to be doing a cool body, no hackle done, and I will be doing a bubble done. Now, let me add my friend Eric Austin in here so we can get a side-by-side. -side. And there he is. We didn't know whether he was going to make it today or not, but there he is, Johnny on the spot. Oh, and out. And I will out. duck out of here and give you the spotlight, my friend. All right. Uh, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare this week, so I'm doing one that some of you may have already seen. I, I know Dick Shaw has seen this fly. Um, and I think maybe, I'm not positive. I did, I've, I've done, I think I might have done this on Al's channel at one point. But I'm going to do my own quill body no hackle done. Uh, and let me show you the, this is the original Swisher Richards uh, style no hackle done. This is done in a PMD version, and this is a style of fly. And my my no hackle is intended to be a a style of fly as well. And uh, this is mine, and this of course borrows heavily from AK Best quill body ideas. And uh, I I was fishing when I developed this fly on the Henry's Fork uh, many years ago now. Uh, I had, I was using, um, you know, quill body parachutes at that time and, and uh, quill body spinners. I was a big believer in the quill bodies and I still am. I, I still like them. This is a detail on the, the wing separation. I've got my own technique. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science. It's nothing totally new, but it's a little different than standard X wraps. And I'll show you that. And um, oh, I wanted I wanted to show you this. Um, it's because it's a no hackle. Flotation becomes really important. So the kind of dubbing you use is important. The tails. I I'm a firm believer that the wider a split you can get with the tails, the better. So I I developed my own variation on a on a well known technique to get a wide split on my tails and not have a big dubbing ball at the at the back end of the fly um and this is the this is what it looks like from the from the front uh let's see here um i've uh, i pretty much do this in a couple of versions one's a pmd for the west and the other is a sulfur for the east and i have to say i think that the sulfur in the east has just been a great fly. The PMD version, I've caught a lot of fish with it, but I don't have the success that I do on Spring Creek, for instance, and Penn's Creek in particular um, with the, uh, you know, um, I have better success there than I do out west, but these materials here that I'm going to show photos of um, are for the PMD version of the fly, not the uh, not the sulfur. And there's just a, sm a small amount of difference. Um, these um, the tails are 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 these microfibits, and I like them because I can get an even wider spread with them than I can with hackle, um, and. Uh, I know a lot of guys hate microfibits for tails, and that's fine. You can you can certainly do this fly with hackle. Uh, on the sulfur version, these tails are, are darker done, um, and this is light done CDC, which is again for the PMD version. Dark, it's darker done, or it's medium done, really, for the uh, sulfur version. Uh, I use these pre-prepared quill bodies from these flies. And you want to use the quill body, not quill body two. Quill body twos are great. They don't need to be soaked or anything, which is terrific. But um, they, uh, 
they sink like a stone, not good for dry flies. And this is the uh, dubbing I like for this fly. It traps a lot of air. It's a bulkier dubbing. It's not super fine. Super fine, while it's great to make a fine body, doesn't float as well. And here is the um, here is the recipe. And for this sulfur version, um, you can tie this pretty big. I've I've caught a lot of fish on the fourteen, and that's what I'm going to be tying it in today is a fourteen. Um, but it depends on the sulfurs, and there's a couple different kinds of sulfurs, and and so forth. There's even a sulfur out west that's pretty small. So anyway, uh, you need you, you know you need to match the sizes of your your duns in your area. Uh, thread is just yellow at uni eight odd or anything seventy denier anything. Uh, wings again medium CDC. Tail dark dun microfibits or hackle split wide and you can also use Coq de Leon and and uh, you know. Just a, just about anything really, um, and body is is sulfur dubbing. So I'm going to get started here, and on this fly, the tail is the first thing to go on, and I'll show you my little wrinkle on the uh, the tailing technique to get a to get a wide split. Um, we'll start, you know, leaving a little space behind the eye like you always do or like I always do anyway. And we'll go back to the bend, and I'm gonna do a, a thread bump back here um, with X wraps. I'm gonna create just a little bump, um, you know, half dozen X wraps or so. You, you, can, you can make this pretty, you wanna keep it as compact as you can. You want it to be like a ball or, or a cylinder. And then we'll take the thread up towards the front. And here's my, they don't look at on, on camera, but these are dark done um, microfibits. And I'm gonna want four or five. It, it can be six as well. Let's see how many I think I have here. Uh, I think that's four or five. Let's let's go with that. And these can be, you know, on a on a on a Swisher Richards style no hackle or the ones that hair up and the the standard no hackle that you might be used to. Um, the tails need to be short because of, they get in the way of mounting the wings, etc. But but with this fly, the tails can be a little longer, and I like them a little longer than shank length. I I just like longer tails. Period. On, on dry flies, I'm going to take the the thread halfway back to the bend. And you've seen this where you take this tag end of the thread and you split these fibers. And let me make sure I have two on a side at least, which I do. Now here's the difference. Normally you'd go like here and tie it in, tie it down. But what I do, I'll take this, I'll angle it down and just and, and start binding it down towards the thread bump. And as I go, these near tails, which are angled down now, they're locked in place right now. So I don't have to think about them. And they will come up naturally due to thread torque. These far tails, I'm going to hold in place. And um, as I go back, they will tend to want, they'll want to go down. So I, I want to hold them, prevent them from going down. I'm going to cut some of this just to get it out of the way. So the near tails will come up. These far tails are going to want to go down. So you got to be careful and keep them, keep them level. 
And then when you get back here, side to side pressure um, should give a nice wide spread to these tails. And I got one on the wrong side here. Hang on. I let go too soon. There we go. That's what I that's what I want to see. That helps float the fly. Next, uh, I'm going to take the thread all the way just about to where I started and then back a little bit to, you know, approximately 30% um, mark, maybe one more on the hook. And I've got two medium done CDC feathers, and uh, these, these are from... Uh, Trout Hunter, Renee Harrop's, what was Renee Harrop's company? I don't know that it's his anymore. Um, their businesses are always in a state of flux, it seems. But uh, I, I really like this CDC, especially for this fly. This is really bushy CDC, all right? And um, I, I think they... I think they they treat it with preen preen oil or something. I don't know. I mean, it has natural preen oil anyway. Um, I want to be able to see these wings. One of the reasons I developed this fly was I was having trouble seeing the wings on my Swisher Richard style no hair duns. Not so much the the hair up style ones that I learned to tie later, but I originally had the sidewinder style, which the wings aren't as high. And so the they weren't as visible. And so that's why that's one of the reasons I developed this. You can you can really see this. All the way back to the tail. We're not gonna not gonna prop the wings up yet. I'm playing with fire here. I I, I just got back, so I haven't I haven't been soaking these um, these quills. This one has a little something something on the top. They get really fine too. So you want to? I don't I don't like this the super. Fine. Uh, I like I like a, a better uh, a wider space um, segmentation. I'm just gonna soak these in my mouth for a second or two. Let's hope let's hope that they don't split. Normally, it's a good idea to to soak these for um, I don't know 10, 15 minutes. Normally I have a I'll have a cup with water in it with a bunch of these soaking in it if I'm tying them for production for my friends or whatever. Uh, now I'm I'm looking on the monitor here and already I'm getting my my spacing a little screwy. And what you have to do is is just angle this back slightly as you wind, and and you'll get. They'll, they'll be closer together, which I was not doing at the time. I was in a big, fat hurry for some reason. Okay, playing with fire here. This might split. All right. Just putting it in my mouth for a couple seconds must have helped. All right. Now, let me let me show something here. If I tie these in, they're like this. When I first tie them in together, think that the eye eye of the hook is out out in front of my fingers here. 
So I tie them in, they're like this. And then as I go up, they kind of get, well, I guess from your point of view, they kind of get like this, um, where, where the rear part is separated, but the, the front part's still together. So my winging technique wants to get these to separate out a little bit in front. That's the point of, of what I'm going to do with my wings. Uh, because I want the, the tops of the wings to be parallel with the hook shank when I'm done. The first thing I'm going to do is prop these up, host them up. It's like you do a... Oops. Can you switch your camera, Eric, please? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I just posted them up. You know, with some with some turns in front, like like so. And is now Eric I'm spotlighted. Is Eric spotlighted? I am on I am on my camera. Yeah, he's oh, spotlighted on mine. Yes. Oh, sorry, just can't get at it. Hmm. All right. Um, anyway, I want to get these back, separate, separate these out and get them back to their original, uh, the original two feathers that I tied in back to back or as close as I can come. And I'll hold this near one up and in place. And what I'm trying to do is get this, uh, get the, um, I'm going to, uh, well, let me just show you what I'm going to do first, and I'll tell you why I'm doing it. Um, I'm going to start here and do a very diagonal wrap. It's going to catch the leading edge of this near, near wing, and I'm going to take three turns going up the wing to get it in place, more or less. And I'm going to do it now from the back. I, I took a turn around the back here to lock this in place so that this won't move when I do this next thing, which is hold this one up in place. Take three turns going up the wing, up the front of the wing on that one. Then, then I, because they're so spent, I don't want them that spent. I'm going to hold them up and take some turns in front and maybe a, even a turn behind. Now, these wings right now are the, um, there's a little bit of lean there, let me see. But more or less, the tops of these wings are parallel with the hook shank. They're, uh, they're, they're not as upright as a Catskill fly. They're, they're half spent. Um, and that is a huge advantage, in my opinion, um, having these wings half spent like this, um, first of all, it's going to float the fly better. You have the water, will will they'll be dubbing down here, so the um, the tail will hold up the rear end. The dubbing will hold this up more or less, but these wings will also help um, because because of that and. Because they're they're half spent like this, the fly floats down beautifully um, onto the water. Ed Van Put, the uh, who, who's a, a famous uh, fly fisherman from the Catskills, and he's 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 written a book, a, at least one book that I have. It's excellent. Um, he actually late later on in in his career switched to a half spent wing rather than the very upright Catskill wings. Um, and then in any case, I I like it. I I think sometimes they take it as a spinner. Uh, I don't know that for a fact because I can't get into these fish's head. This is uh, Al's Wax Tacky. I'm going to dub this and we're going to be done. This is the uh, 
sulfur orange hair up dubbing, but you can use you can use any kind of rough rougher dubbing. You know, beaver might be good. Natural fur like beaver would be good on this. I would think anything that floats well and traps a lot of air. I don't particularly like um, super fine for no hackles. That said, Mike Lawson ties his no hackles, which are superb, with super fine. So what do I know? You know, it's 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 a matter of opinion. I think in my case, what happened with me is I tied I tied some uh, standard no hackles for my friends, not not this fly, but other, and. They complained that they didn't float well, and I had used super fine on them. So I changed the dubbing, and then they said, yeah, they're fine now. So that that was uh, my experience, and I've just used the bulkier dubbing ever since. Um, I don't put any dubbing in between the wings at all, just like on a regular no hackle. And... Uh, I want a nice bulky thorax on this thing. And a three turn whip finish forward. We're done. And I got, I got these tiny little scissors. I'll show you these in a sec. Oh God, that's sweet. I got this is this is the small the smallest size I think that Dr. Slick makes. And and here's here's this here's these scissors from Germany. I just got these and so far I'm in love. The only problem is even though the even though these are fairly wide, um I have trouble getting my middle finger out of them if it goes if it goes in too far like this. I have, <laughs> my knuckle barely clears. And um, that's my cool body no hackle done. Um, it's, it's very easy to tie. That's one of another reason I developed it. And uh, I'll tell you a quick, quick story about the first time I used it on Henry's fork. Um, and I'd, I'd been frustrated. And Henry's fork is tough anyway, and I wasn't doing well. I decided I needed to invent something. And uh, I worked one night and kind of came up with this. I didn't have this, the winging technique exact, but I had I got the wings using a bunch of thread wraps kind of where I wanted them. And I got the tail split as wide as I wanted and I got the quill body on there and so forth. And I the next day I went out to Bonefish Flats at Henry's Fork, which is like a, a, a small lake that's about knee deep everywhere. Um, and uh, so it's dead flat water for the most part. But between two islands, there's a little, uh, where two currents meet, there's a little, almost like a little riffle, just a, a, a seam, if you will. And uh, I'm sitting there for much of the morning with my new fly at the ready and nothing's going on. And then the wind picked up and all of a sudden, all these bugs got blown into the seam. Um, spinners and so forth were all caught up in this seam and it was like, it formed like a chum line. It was really cool. And I, I got in position right away when I saw that. I said, man, something's going to happen. And it did. This big fish started to, you could see this big head come up and he took um, a bug or two at the, at the very head of the line, starts working his way down the line. And so I got my fly, put, got my fly in that, in the line and this fish took it and, and it was a big fish and those fish, and Henry's fork are hot, and he took off like a bonefish. Next thing I know, the fish he's tail walking like a, you know, like like a a, a tarpon or, or like a uh, um, 
marlin or something, you know. And uh, then he's then he starts jumping this big rainbow. And uh, I think it was about the, the second or third jump. That was that was that. <laughs> no big fish for me, but uh, it was a thrill, and my new fly worked. So I was I was pretty happy about the the whole deal. And it looks like Al is just coming back. So any any questions about this fly or anything at all? Okay. Al? No, no questions there. I'll, um... I've got one, Al. It's Neil. All right. Actually, Neil. It, isn't a, it isn't a question. Um, it's a comment. I like your fly a lot. Our techniques are, are a little bit different, but I, I don't even want to tell you how many of that style I've done. Um, but two things, um, they work great if you want a small betas or betas, as some people say. You can go down to 20s with with um, Trout Hunter CDC, and you just get a great uh, thorax um, BWO. Uh, the other oh, thing, I, I yeah, I don't don't mean to interrupt, but uh, I've I've caught a number of fish with a betas version of this and. And also, um, on the Mad River, they get quite a betas hatch in the fall. And uh, I've done really well with a, a size 20. It also there... makes great. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the wings are, are, are tough Use, using this. Uh, they're a little tougher at, the, at that size, you know, just to get to get them in your fingers, I, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. They also make great mahoganies and great March Browns. Um, oh. To your point on liking wide tails, I'm glad to finally hear that and longer tails. Um, I've always done mine that way. And for what it's worth, over the winter, I went back and reread Vince Marinero, and he calls them outriggers. He doesn't yes. refer to them as tails, and I'm like, aha, got it. Because my belief is that fish don't really see the tails. They're taking they the fly before that. It's 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 all about the wing, and that's where Vin, Vince Marinero was really right. You know, yes. the wing is the thing, as far as I'm concerned, with dry flies. I I love a prominent wing, you know. Well, I like the way you did your thorax on that. And to me, I feel the, the wing and the thorax are the two triggers of that fly. Everything else doesn't matter. It's for us. Eric, I had a, I had a quick question for you. As far as the, uh, with the wing, I know you said that you had fished um, this no hackle version on bonefish flats, and you described it a lot like a, just a slick lake. Do you find that if you wanted to fish a little heavier water that you can maybe double up the wing um, in order to to get that additional just extra bit of buoyancy from the CDC? I've noticed some of the water that I fish here in the um, the driftless, I have a pattern that's, that I tie that is uh, very similar. And I'll go down 24 or even 26 with CDC. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, much like yourself, wide tail to keep, you know, the 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 additional weight of the bend of the hook being at the back, it makes sense to use those as outriggers, but the, the prominent wing, and I've noticed if I double up on the wing, I can fish it. Um, in particular, if I use um, a really good CPC floating, um, I can typically, if I've double up the wing, I can get it to fish uh, still low in the water, but even through a little heavier riffle. And I was curious, do you do that as well, where you'll kind of double up your wings instead of two? Well, I, I have not done that. I it, it certainly sounds like a plan to me. But uh, I did fish this. There's uh, uh, the place I, fi I fish most in PA. And I guess my, my, my friend Tom Wilson's not here tonight. But um, <clears throat> Tom, Tom likes this one riffle and he use, normally fishes – it's it's it, it's it's kind of like a series of they're not waterfalls, uh, but there's a hill going down into a big pool. Normally, I'm fishing the big pool, all right. But Tom got me fishing the riffle one night, and uh, I was surprised and pleasantly surprised how how well this fly did as is in in this riffly water. Now, I I've always got. 
Prague's Fanny at the ready over yeah. here. And yeah. I can't tell you, I'm, I, I, I know for a fact, I went to the Frog's Fanny uh, probably more than a couple times. But um, I was really focused on getting a drift and doing a lot of, a lot of casts in a row. And I, it was really tough for me to get a drift. It's very difficult waiting. It gets deep. And I was, I was almost swept away at one point. But um, when all was said and done, I was able to get the drift I wanted and 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 caught this nice, nice. I've noticed that if I am if I do double up a wing, I can put it more in a spent position, and that's the good thing about CDC is depending on how you're treating it. You know, you can kind of shape it, um, especially if you're uh, you know a lot of the drop pulls and the Smokies and stuff. We were able to you know it, it wasn't a cast so much as a a, a reach out and dab and. Uh, if you had placed the CDC wings in a more of a spent profile or spent position, and if you had doubled the wings so that you had that additional fiber, um, you know, touching the, the the water, it was pretty surprising how well those little no hackles of uh, CDC will float through, you know, some pretty makes, significant rip, riffles. Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. Um, let me say this, you know, they, they've doubled up the wings on the conventional no, no hackle as well. In fact, that's one of the flies I'm going to do one of these weeks is a double wing no hackle. Um, and, you know, I thought going in that it was going to be twice as hard. And the no hackle, a standard no hackle is hard enough oh, as it yep. is. But um, the doubled wings certainly are no harder. Um, um, and. It might even, it might even be a little easier. I don't know. Uh, jury's still out. I haven't tied enough of them yet. But um, oh, I one thing on on this fly, um, if you you notice how I did, I did three wraps up the wing one direction and three up the wing the other. Uh, one was front to back. The other was back to front. If you do five or six wraps you now have a spinner okay it it lo it will lower that those wings down just like you're talking about um just adding more wraps up the wing so that's how that's how i tie all my spinners now it's good to have a, a good uh, portion of both i guess so uh you know, five wraps, three wraps, and just uh, load your box full of them. They they work really well. I, uh, yeah. One of my favorite patterns to fish. Yeah, the, it's, the, a, it's the a good one fly. place, um, Eric, where where two um, CDC feathers work really well is if you're doing comparisons for the trico hatch in the morning. You can do the no thorax, and the problem with one is that it soaks up real fast. And then you've just got a straight post going downstream. But frog for me, frog's fanny is the best. But if I put two CDC feathers on there, there's that much better flotation. And they stay dry longer. They stay floating longer. I got to try that. I, I, I've fished a lot of CDC comparisons as well. And again, I like that wide split on the tail on those. But uh, in any case... Uh, yeah, it sounds like doubling these up might, uh, you know, might solve a problem. My favorite term for CDC is trout crack. <laughs> well, that's yeah, what it is. I'm a, I'm a believer myself, but you know, I don't get me wrong. I, I understand a lot of guys, especially guides, really want these flies to float, and and they're more deer hair guys typically. They want these things to float forever, um, so they so the guide can see them, and so their their sport has an easier time fishing them, and doesn't you know doesn't have to constantly go to the frogs fanny. So, I get it. I mean, I I certainly get it. Um, you know, it's it's a belief of mine that that CDC is a little more effective, but you know, until you're in a trout's head, you don't really know anything. You just you get a you get a feeling after a while. So, Al, you you ready? I am definitely ready, but I want to make sure that the questions from the folks regarding yours are all answered before we move on. Any more questions? 
Okay, Eric, thank you. All right. And your pattern and your comments on your pattern are an absolute perfect segue into the one that I'm going to be doing. I call it the bubble done. And I've fished one version of this or another since the mid 80s. And um, well, we'll talk about that. But one of the things, the points that you made, you'll, you'll see in the profile of my fly, and that is the um, bulky thorax area. I call it shoulders. I know that's not the shoulders on the bug, but I equate a lot of things to the human body and the shoulders are big and broad. And then the rest of the body is pretty nice and slender. And that's the way mine is going to be. And that's the way you did yours. And why would I want to do that? Well, let's, let's take a look at a friend of mine's photography. That is, his name is John Kreft at Riverkeeper Flies. He has a twice weekly blog. If you don't, if you're not a member, I would sure recommend. It doesn't cost anything. There's the website. But here's what I wanted to talk about. Here's one of his photos. And take a look at these duns that are, yeah, they're crippled. And that's one of the reasons that I have this particular photo. But I wanted to point out something to you. Just exactly what Eric was talking about. Look at the thorax area, the, the bulk, the bulk, the bulk. Eric put it in his fly. You're going to see the same thing in my fly. Built out of a different, uh, uh, different materials than, than what Eric used. But anyway, let's uh, get that over here. And let's go take a look at the recipe. I'm going to, let's take a look at the fly. I'll just get back here. This is the guy right here. Let's just turn it around so you can see. We've got the, the split tails. We have a comparadun type wing. But you'll notice that we have um, a head up front. And you'll notice the size of the thorax area, uh, basically as a result of the bubble head uh, formed out of, the, out of the hair. Now, the reason that I developed this guy is back in the 80s, when getting hackle was a, was a problem, I developed a fly called the Muddle May. And that's not, not what we're going to talk about today, but I want you to notice the profile on the Muddle May is the same thing. It's got a, it's got a big uh, thorax area and the wings and hackle and so forth. Not too dissimilar profile-wise between the Muddle May and the Bubble Dun, with one exception. I'm a pretty good fly tire. I can even speed tie fairly well. And this dog on Muddle May takes me about 10 minutes to do one. And I can do three or four of these bubble duns in the same time. And I have to admit, um, I don't think that there's a heck of a lot of difference on the water between one or the other. So guess what I would tie as a working guide? Well, let's lay the Muddle May down. That's a gee whiz, wonderful fly. It's a great fly. But this is the one that I used uh, starting on Hoodoo Creek out of Sandpoint, Idaho. And I found that I just would really slay the fish on uh, a fly very similar to this, tied with the, with the bubble head. Then I would go north out of Sandpoint to, up to the uh, Canadian border area. And there's a river up there, leaving behind my Spring Creek, a Hoodoo Creek, which is about 20 foot wide, going to a tough old river, the Kootenai, which is... Um, a quarter of a mile wide, wider in some places, narrower in others, but it's some rough water with some good back eddies. This fly worked well, no matter whether it was a spring creek or whether it was in heavy water, because it, like Eric said, the guides like the stuff that float forever. Well, that's for sure, because when you're guiding customers, if they're inexperienced uh, fly fishers, they can tend to drown the fly pretty easy. Well, it takes a lot to sink this fly. You can just put a little bit more grease on it after it's been sunk a few times, and, and <clears throat> it will uh, continue to do its job. But let's get over here and take a look at the recipe. Like almost all the flies that Gretchen and I do, we don't tie a PMD. We tie a fly that's colored like a PMD. And this bubble done can be a PMD. It can be anything you want because the hook sizes range from size 8 for you know, like a big uh, uh, green drake or some such, on down to 22s. I'm using gray thread today, black, but again, it's choice. The tail is moose, but I have used hackle. I've used um, uh, the same thing that, that Eric used on his, uh, the micro fibbits. 
Uh, the body is going to be dubbing. However, I've done the, done this with all kinds of quill bodies, uh, the biot bodies, etc. The one thing that re remains pretty constant here, though, is the deer hair hackle and the deer hair head. But you notice the question marks because I've also done it with CDC, applied in the same way, and elk. And uh, a couple of times I, I tried antelope and found out that it was just uh, it, it didn't have the strength that it needed after a couple of fish. It was just totally exploded. But anyway, let's get a look at the materials here, and we'll see what we're what we're working with. And I've got, well, right right here. I'm going to be using dubbing wax with my dubbing, and I'm just using hairs here today. I happen to have it handy, so that's what we're using. Uh, the hackle and header will be deer, moose for the tail, with a hair stacker, thread, and and then uh, dry fly hooks. These are size 12, but again, I've tied a little bit larger size for what we're doing right here. And of course, I sprayed everything down with static guard to get rid of the static electricity. So let me just get out of, out of here real quick. And move over to the yep, wrong one over to the vise and i'll take this guy out <clears throat> and put a hook in and get ready to put this put this guy into business now let's get over here and take a few of these materials and set them over at the vise now i'll, I'll need my hair stacker i'll set that over there uh, Get the dubbing and the dubbing wax here in a minute. I'll need the thread to get started. And I think that'll do it for now. First thing I'll be using will be this deer hair. So I'll get that down where it's handy to get to. And let's get back over to the vise and bring my thread into the equation. And I'm just going to start right at the hook eye. And I'll just put a thread base there that's well, probably a couple of eye widths long and Trim it off and throw in a quick half hitch just so it stays right there. Doesn't get the sliding back. Sometimes they get the reefing on the hair and it'll move back from the hook eye. And I don't want that to happen. So anyway, let's get back over to the materials. And I'll just take a bundle of this deer hair. And I'm not going to go through my spiel of where you get the, the hair off of the deer and everything. I noticed just about everybody on tonight's. Um, or this afternoon or wherever you are uh, with Jay Lee being in the middle of the night in, in the Netherlands and Eric probably has moved into the evening where he is. But anyway, I'm going to move over to the vise, straighten out my hair. It's got a little bit of curve in it, so I'm just going to put a series of crimps on that, get that all straightened out and get rid of this waste right in here. So I'll get over the waste bin there with that and clean that out so that I don't get all that trash and stuff all over the camera lens. It, normally I do that right at my tying station, but um, I got a problem. I sprayed all this down with static guard to get rid of static electricity. And this stuff is sticking to me all over the place. There you kind of get an idea. Well, I'm going to have to do something about that, but first I don't want to lose my hair. So I'll stick it in my stacker. Oh boy. It's, when the static electricity gets in there, guys, it's sticking to everything. I want you to, it's sticking to my hands, to the to the stacker, everything. Well, that's what we deal with here in the Rocky Mountain West. I'll get try to throw that. And I won't let go. Won't let go. So what we're going to do is get my spray can out. Now this is the big spray can of static guard, and around the outside I have wrapped a bounce pad. It's the thing you put in the clothes dryer when you dry your clothes to get rid of static electricity for the clothes that you're drying. Well, I just take a couple of rubber bands, put it around my, my spray can so that when I don't want to spray everything down, I just want to get some static off of my hands. I just rub my hands over this thing and then set it aside. And I should be good to go from here on. Find out here real quick. So let me stack my hair. And tip the stacker up, make sure. Looks like I've got a pretty good bundle of hair there. And 
Luckily, it doesn't look like I've got any broken tips. Good deal. All right, I don't have to mess with that. Now, I am going to take this hair and make it about as long as the complete hook. Got a little bit more there than I want, so I'll get rid of some of it. It's real easy to overdress that, that bubble head, so I'm making sure that I don't do that. Now, I'm just going to set that right in there. And one of the things that happens to a lot of people is fighting thread torque with hair. And, it, you know, that thread torque is that natural tendency of things to push away, just like that's doing right there. Thread under tension causes hair to, to move away from it. Unless you take a loop around the hair first, slide it down into place, and then anchor it, it just stays right on top. It can't go anywhere but because it's got kind of a figure eight over the bundle of hair holding it in place. Now let me just trim this out of the way here. Notice how I made a really a real severe cut on that, so it's a nice gentle taper towards the back of the hook. And I'm just going to go ahead and wrap my thread over that to get those ends gathered. And let's get over to the materials now, and I'll just grab a couple of fibers, because I only want about two or three fibers for my tail. This is going to be a Spring Creek fly. <clears throat> And I've got a, a few more than that, but I can see three, three fibers right there that are all about the same length. Yep, I'm just about right. I'm just going to go ahead and tie them on. I don't even need to stack them. And like Eric, I like to have the tails slightly long. I don't much care whether, they, whether they're split or not because uh, the design in the front end of this fly tends to make the need for outriggers go away. Doesn't mean that I don't have them, but let's get these on, hold around out here. And I'll trim off the waist. Okay, wrap it back just a little bit further. I just want to make sure that I don't have any hair in front. You know, sometimes these fibers will cross down under like that. You don't want that. So I'm just making sure that they're all up on top like I wanted them to be. And that loop around the bundle should make them stay up on top, but I just wanted to make sure that nothing had changed. Okay, so let's get the dubbing into the equation here right now. And I'll get my wax and my dubbing. <clears throat> I'll just set the wax over there at the tying station. And I'll take and pull a, a clump of this dubbing out of the bag. So... I'm getting enough stuff over there. Now, now I don't need the bag over there. I'll just take and grab a bundle of this dubbing and take it over and have it ready to use at the station. <clears throat> Back over here, I'm going to put my dubbing wax cap down on the surface like this. Right down here so that it's, it's pointing up. So that you'll see what I'm going to do here in just a little bit. Right now, we're back here putting our wax on the thread. And I want you to notice that I kind of daub the wax on rather than try to stroke it on. Because often when you stroke it on, little lumps come off on the, on the thread and you don't want that. So now I want you to notice that I'm turning my wax upside down and going straight down into that cap. So I don't do what I've done in the past, and that is forget and knock the dog on, take the, not put the cap on it and knock the wax into the trash bin. Let me, uh, let me reassure you that makes just an awful mess to clean up. Let's, um, you can see here, if I put this up like this, I'll get that around, so there you, there you can see it pretty good right there. I've got a pretty good application, uh, not overly ap application along the, the, the thread. Well, let's just get down here and if I were a little man standing on top of the hook, looking down, then that's the perspective I'm going to use to go in the clockwise direction when I twist my dubbing. Does it make any difference? I don't know. I don't think it makes a lot of difference, but that's what I've been doing of late, and it seems to work pretty good, and it seems to keep the dubbing the way I want it. So let's get started wrapping this stuff in place.
Okay, and I like to turn my vice a little as I as I do the work. Because how many times have you tied a fly and you say, doggone George or Tom or whoever you are, that fly looks pretty good. And then you look at the other side and you got a space that you missed. Doggone. Talk about frustrating, especially when you find out after the fact. And by the way, I pulled my fly out of the vise, so I'll put it back in the vise now. You thought I was going to get all flustered over that. Thankfully, I caught it before it dropped in the, in the waste bin. I would have said, oh, darn, or something like that. Anyhow, we're just going to continue getting this in place. And now we're going to push our, our wing and head over. One of the things about hair, whether you're tying a humpy, a wolf, or, or a bubble head like this, or a bullet head like some of the others, you cannot pull the hair tight. You can get it, you can pull it snug. You have to push it tight. So I want you to watch and see what I'm doing right there. Pushing right there. Now I'll grab, and then I'll take my thumbnail in front there and push that up and over so it really tightens that up. See how that tightens that all, all up real nice? And now I'm going to go ahead and bind that into place. Not letting go of my ha hair, I'm pushing it, pushing it up. Because it's really important that I have that wing standing up. And I want to have it fanned out as well because it's, it's part of the outriggers that Eric was talking about earlier. Okay. And that fly is done with the exception of throwing a whip finish on it. Now I'm going to show you something else that's come along for me since I first started fishing with this fly in the in the 80s. That is this stuff right here. It's a, you can't tell what it is, but it's a it's a UV resin, and it's really good for making those wings stay standing up. Now let me show you what I'm going to do here. See if I can turn that so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, right there. I'm just going to put just a little bit of that resin. Come on, hold still, Vice. Not holding my, there we go. I'm just going to put a little drop right in there at the base of that, that hair. All right, I'm going to put the cap back on that before I forget. Turn on my UV light. But before I do that, what I want to do is pull all those fibers so they're nice and straight. So I'll just put my tweezers behind them and then put the light on them. And the wings are up for good. And there you've got the fly. Any questions? That is a brilliant way to do uh, yeah. deer hair, to put it on looping at once, Al. <laughs> Thank you. I'd never seen or thought of that. Yeah. that. Uh, uh, I am, I'm blown away by this. Um, the touch at the end there uh, to get, to keep it standing up permanently. You know, it seems like all, all my comparisons go one way or another. I, I've I've even tied them in. You know, both directions, put wraps in front, behind. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. I love that. I uh, I even do that on some of the see. You can see how you could switch and use the same concept with CDC or whatever. You know, just tie a couple of CDC feathers on them, fold them over, stand them up. They're going to flop back down. Put a little drop of that UV in there. <clears throat> I, I don't use UV a lot, but I sneak it into places where it's sure handy sometimes. Great. And I don't see any. Oh, by the way, Amy really liked your split tail. She probably don't like my split tail because it's not very split, but it's it does a, it does the job. I think and that's, it matters. <laughs> well, we don't have any questions, so that's good. Let me uh, add Eric's spotlight right next to me so that you can chat with us both. Then there we go. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for that. This is Amy. Um. I was helping with Trout in the Classroom releases all last week, a big flurry of Reno and Carson City releases. 
and our fishing biologist from Indau had scooped up a couple of buckets for the um, insect, aquatic insect inspection. And he had brought it down to the Carson River. And can you highlight my picture? See if it comes through right in front of my face. Oh, get on there. It Just won't, I minute. can't do this. Uh, let, me spot, let me add you to... Uh... Let me add your spotlight. Okay, you're at, you're spotlighted with us right now. Okay, we'll see. Okay, there we go. That <laughs> they were hatching right in front of me, out of the bucket. I just about couldn't <laughs> stand it. The, <laughs> one after another, it was so fun. To see all those blue wing olives <clears throat> popping up. <laughs> Amy, it's funny you should mention that because I spent all day with our trout in the classroom, people, and uh, all of our <laughs> insects were, were, it was cold today, and they all died. They all froze to death in the bucket we were keeping them in. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that, that's oh, talking man. about things not working out the way you wanted, John. <laughs> well, ain't that the truth? <laughs> yeah. Sounds a lot like here. It was, we had two inches of snow today, so I'm jealous of anybody seeing any bugs hatching today. We might get a midge every once in a while, but. It's been a little cold. I uh, I have to admit that I mowed the lawn today here in Idaho. It was a little <laughs> chilly, but I mowed the lawn. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely jealous. Uh, Al, I wanted to say thanks for the static guard tip. I actually told my wife I'll install her uh, her her dryer sheets, her bounce dryer sheets, and stuck them up next to my desk and been rubbing all my my bucktail and uh, and deer patches down with them and it's made a heck of a difference um just keeping you know stuff from from sticking to you and, and and making it a little difficult to tie so that was a really good tip that i picked up last week that's made a difference immediately oh. in my time well you got to see it in actuality today with it sticking to my hands and yep. I, I, that wasn't that wasn't a put up job or anything it was just it was uh it was the real static electricity that we live with here in a dry climate yeah. Or those of you in a less in a more humid climate don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> Thank you everyone for joining us. For now, it's a wrap. Until next time, probably next week, we'll be seeing you all. <laughs>